to look at a subject today, the new old lie, the new old lie. Let's begin, please, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, a well-known passage. The serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. Doubting God's word. The simple, straightforward meaning. This does not deny exegesis. Exegesis will always confirm the simple, straightforward meaning. But the enemy is subtle. And we see this affected Eve, the woman, particularly. But let's look, please, to St. Paul's reference to this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simple devotion and purity and simplicity of Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. He's complaining that the church would accept things beautifully that were false, even things about the nature of Christ, Christology, things about the nature of the gospel, or the spirit thinking something was of the Holy Spirit when it wasn't, but it's another spirit. Many things counterfeit the Holy Spirit of demonic origin. We've referred multiple times to the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Much of what infiltrates the church today is the zeitgeist. It's the demonic spirit of the age infiltrating or permeating Christian thought. One of the areas where this happens, of course, is in the area of the feminism of the secular world infiltrating the church, something related to what we call the Jezebel spirit. We've spoken of this many times. But let's understand something. There is something in the nature of men and women caused by the fall, particularly, at least certainly amplified greatly by the fall, Men have become insensitive. They were not created insensitive, but fallen man, masculine, male, is insensitive. Women are hypersensitive. Men are less likely to get saved. It's more difficult for men to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, usually. Women are much more sensitive. They get saved easier. Most of the time when a husband and wife get saved, as we pointed out, it's the wife who gets saved first. If a husband gets saved first, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, the wife eventually becomes a believer. But when the boots are on the other feet, there are many godly women with unsaved husbands. Men are insensitive. Women, however, are hypersensitive. They are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction, as we pointed out. Multiple times, the male antenna is too short, the female antenna is too long. Men just don't get it, but when they get the signal, it's usually the right one. Women can pick up all kinds of signals and mistake it for being the voice of the Spirit. They can even pick up two contradictory signals and try to reconcile them in their mind. These things are products of the fall. Now, men and women are co-equally intelligent. They're co-equally intelligent. Every study shows that. Every study proves that. Men are not smarter than women, and women are not smarter than men. It depends on the individual, essentially. Physical strength is different. Women are called the weaker vessel by Paul, but they're not only called the weaker vessel because males have larger muscle mass, greater bone density. Women are weak spiritually, 
because of their vulnerability to spiritual seduction. Men are reliant on female sensitivity. When a husband and wife pray for direction or guidance, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest if they're saved. But anything God intends for good, the world and the devil will use for evil. While it's easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is also easier for women to hear the voice of a counterfeit spirit. Men have the opposite problem. Women are reliant on male protection, as men are reliant on female sensitivity. Now let's apply this anatomically the same, the weaker vessel idea. Are men stronger than women? Well, yes and no. Men, obviously, have bigger muscle mass, have bigger bone mass. Orthomuscular density of a male is 50% on average greater than that of a female. When a female overdevelops her musculature, she becomes unattractive. But let's understand something. There is one area where women are stronger than men considerably stronger. The pubic arch on the female is greater than 45 degrees. It can stretch to facilitate childbirth. No male, the strongest male in the world, could not do that. You have a narrower angulation in the pubic arch in a male. Women are physically stronger in the area of reproduction. Also, the ovaries are internal in a female. They're well protected. They're internal. A male is much more vulnerable because of gonads, because of male genitalia. Men are much more vulnerable to serious problems involving things like athletic accidents and so forth. The women are just stronger reproductively in the sense of anatomical positioning. Women are stronger than men sexually in that sense. Men have to accept the fact that women can do things they can't, that they are stronger in terms of reproductive physiology and anatomy. On the other hand, male menopause is not, well, the male equivalent of menopause is not the same as the female. The female will eventually run out of ovum. She will eventually stop ovulating. Male will not, even an aged male will continue to produce spermatozoa. Uh, that's why you see in Hollywood sometimes these 70 year old actors who have babies with younger women, they, they impregnate younger women. An older man can impregnate a younger woman, but a, a, an older woman cannot become impregnated postmenopausally, barring divine intervention. You'll see that a uh, a 35-year-old male is reproductively compatible with a 25-year-old female. But a 35-year-old female is borderline incompatible with a 25-year-old male. She's approaching menopause. They each have their own areas of strength and weakness. That is true spiritually. That is true physiologically. It is true psychologically. Men are stronger in some ways, women in others. There is an equality between men and women, but there is a difference. Women are the weaker vessel. They are to be protected. Despite their strengths, despite their capacity to do things, male members of the human species cannot. God designed it that way, unfortunately, the fall of man has made a mess of everyone, male and female. So here we are as Christians trying to live as new creations in a fallen world, an old protoplasm. Praise God when Jesus comes, there'll be a resurrection or we shall be changed, whichever happens first. In the meantime, we're stuck with the realities the same as the unsaved people are. However, that's not good enough. It's not good enough for the devil, it's not good enough for the world, and it's not good enough for the worldly church. 
Remember, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. The spiritual seduction of women is a reflection, a microcosm of the spiritual seduction of the church. A woman who is not under the protective covering of males, that is a Christian husband, a Christian older brother, a Christian father, the male leadership of the church, such women are hyper vulnerable to deception and spiritual seduction. That's the way it is. Because when the church is not under the headship of Christ, it is hyper vulnerable to spiritual seduction. He is the bridegroom. The church is the bride. It is an analogy. Now, I know most of you know these things. We've discussed them before on various other recorded teachings. But by way of background for our new viewers and listeners, that's the introduction. Let us continue. The new old lie. Again, the lies of the devil are never per se new. They've always been around. They just come back into vogue at different times. The lie that is being propagated today as pretending to be something new, when it in fact is not at all new, but it's in vogue, is something we are calling today complementarianism. That's the theological term, sometimes the philosophical term given to it, complementarianism. There are people who engage in complementarianism who do not understand that it's called that, but that is the academic term for it. Well, let's look at some examples of complementarianism. Complementarianism is when you seek to change the plain meaning of something that Scripture says by subtle means that tries to make aberrational theology or wrong doctrine appear to be compatible with orthodoxy or with sound doctrine. Through mishandling the scriptures and through crafty speech, under the influence of the devil, there are people who are used by Satan to attempt to take things that are directly contrary to the word of God and make them seem somehow compatible with it. They do this by mishandling the scripture and by packaging it in manipulative, deceptive speech. This is what Satan did with Eve. It is not new. All of these things go back to the garden and the fall of man and complementarianism is no exception. For instance, dogmatically, the Roman Catholic Church officially says, officially says, homosexuality is wrong, it's a sin. Lesbianism is wrong, it's a sin. Three weeks ago in my native New York, some Catholic priests from Fordham University and some Paulist fathers from a religious order of priests called Paulist in New York had a quote-unquote gay service welcoming gays into the Catholic communion of worship without dealing with the fact that the scripture says it was sin. Now, of course, we know that many Roman Catholic clergy themselves are homosexuals and nuns lesbians. This has always gone on. It's simply been made known and divulged in more recent years. It's always gone on. But they are trying to be, quote-unquote, gay-friendly. Now, again, I'm not against homosexuals. I know homosexuals who've gotten saved to become Christians, as I've said many times. In my way with youth, I was addicted to cocaine. The Lord delivered me from cocaine addiction, and he can deliver people and does deliver people from homosexuality. God bless them. They're my brethren. They're my sisters. I wish them well. The same Jesus who saved me saved them who gave me a new life, has given a new life to them, but they need Jesus to give them the new life. Yet the Catholic Church has not changed its official position. This present pope, 
calls himself Francis, who was implicated in the protection of pedophile clergy in Latin America when he was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Argentina. This Pope says, if two men are in a committed relationship, who am I to judge? <laughs> Yet the Church of Rome has not officially changed its position in its catechism. This is obviously pure hypocrisy. By changing his speech and by distorting what Scripture says about love and forgiveness and acceptance, he attempts to make something that is heterodox, that is incompatible with Scripture, that is not scriptural, with orthodoxy, that which is. He tries to make the two compatible. Now, the Catholic Church does this. Well, the Catholic Church does a lot of things. But what happens when born-again believers do it, when evangelicals do it, and they are doing it? Complementarianism, a subtle distortion of Scripture, packaging it with crafty speech to try to make it appear that something that is contrary to Scripture is scriptural. To the point where they say, well, the church has always gotten it wrong. Now we have to get it right. We have to correct these centuries of error. It's not really scriptural what we've always been taught. Someone sent me a video clip of a woman called Dana Crosby. And her message was the Mother Day message or the Mother's Day message. And I watched it. And I listened carefully to what she said. She came from a church background where women were, I would have to say, suppressed, not allowed to speak in meetings, things like this. We have this in Great Britain with like the closed brethren, among others, the exclusive brethren. Not the open brethren, but the exclusive brethren are like this. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's what 1 Corinthians teaches. It's not right. I'm not against women praying in churches or sharing testimonies. I'm not against women exercising gifts of the Spirit, including charismatic gifts. I am not a cessationist. I also believe that because Paul said, let the older women teach the younger women, women can have the gift of teaching to other women. Women can function as deaconesses, etc. Women have a place in the ministry, but leadership is male. Women are to operate with their heads covered, not speaking of a veil or a hat, but under the male leadership of the church, as the church is under Christ. I don't believe in the suppression of women or that women can't talk or can't pray or can't prophesy or engage in charismatic gifts. I don't even think it's right to say women can't teach, providing they're teaching women if they do so in God's order. But this woman comes along from this background as if she's made some great discovery. And she says, no, the church has gotten it wrong. We have to go back to the scriptures and see what it really says. And women can be teachers because the church has misinterpreted the scripture. She begins quite craftily by saying something that was true. Now, what we know about false teachers from 2 Peter chapter 2 is this, something you've heard me say many times. Para sozusin, they put truth next to error. False teachers always use deception by placing things that are true next to things that are erroneous or false. She said in Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who bewitched you if you get circumcised? <laughs> Christ is of no advantage to you, things like this. But she said, but you have to take that out of context. What it's really talking about is non-Jews converting to Judaism in order to become Christians. It's not talking about the physical act of circumcision itself. She's correct. She's correct. She establishes the premise where the text must be interpreted in context and the historical 
background, the Sitzim Leben, must be taken into consideration in the exegesis. This is rightly dividing the word of God, rightly dividing an exegesis. She begins with something right. She says something true. False teachers usually begin by saying something right, something that is true. That's the bait. But then she goes on and does a number of other things. The first thing she does, and what is typical of people who are bringing feminism of the world into the church, which is the Jezebel spirit, is she states that in the culture of that time, women were not educated. They didn't have professional women university educated in the professions in those days. Now, I have a daughter who's a corporate lawyer. I have a wife who's a mathematician with a degree in biblical Hebrew. My, my family has a lot of educated women. Um, I have Christian friends who are physicians or lawyers who are in the professions. I know a lot of educated Christian women. Uh, but the culture does not change the nature of women any more than it changes the nature of men. Education is not going to make a woman less vulnerable to spiritual seduction. It's not going to happen. You're not going to change the nature of men with education, and you're not going to change the nature of women with education. Yes, the cultural background must be taken into consideration. But when you try to use culture and the cultural background of the text, the Zitzimleben, as a theologian would call it, to try to negate a fundamental reality about human nature and the fallen nature of man, this is perverted. This is perverting the word of God out of context. Completely perverted. It doesn't matter how educated a man is, he's still going to be insensitive. The Holy Spirit's going to have to convict him, and men usually take more conviction than women. He's fallen. Doesn't matter how smart he is. Women are the same. Professional women, educated women, it doesn't matter how smart they are. They are still women. We are all fallen, male and female alike. Culture and education have no impact on the nature of man, nor on the fallen nature of man, but she plays that card. Liberal theologians always do that, but this woman claims to be a born-again evangelical. She's doing the same thing the liberals do, theological liberals. Well, her next game twisting the scriptures out of context. She appeals to 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, saying, well, look, women can prophesy, women can exercise these charismatic gifts. That's true. Therefore, she says, women can teach because prophesying is teaching. Oh, Women preach the gospel. They're the first ones who saw the resurrection, and they told others. That is charismatic preaching. That is charisma. No one says that women cannot tell people the gospel. But that is not the daskin. That is not the exposition of doctrine. Now, again, women can practice the daskin to other women, but not to mixed congregations, the Word of God says. Her argument, now look, it was the women who proclaimed Jesus. She's confusing evangelism with exegesis. But then she does something else. She confuses the gift of prophecy and the spoken charismatic gifts with the gift of teaching. The enemy is subtle. 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14 are primarily referring, primarily referring to charismatic gifts, charismata, primarily. 
The word charism actually means grace. It doesn't mean what she says. It is not talking about ministry gifts primarily. The one partial exception in the entire three chapters is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 26, where it does mention teaching. But if you read the text in its immediate context, coming down to verses 34 and 35, a few verses later that explain verse 26, it says women are not to do it. She's confusing kerygma with the daskin. Then she confuses kerygma with something called homelia. Homelia, we get the word homily. Prophecies are given for the exhortation of the church, we are told. Sometimes the warning of the church, sometimes there may be a predictive element, but it's homelia. Homelia is homelia. Kerygma is kerygma, and dedaskin is dedaskin. Exhortation is exhortation. Evangelism is evangelism. Exposition of doctrine is exposition of doctrine. Dividing the word of God exegetically. She conflates the three, confuses the three, and then attempts to confuse the listeners by equating prophecy with teaching. This is a lie of the devil. That woman is teaching a lie. Dana Crosby taught a lie to God's people. Whether she believed the lie herself is irrelevant. James 3.1 says, Let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. I will give account to the Lord on the day of judgment for everything I'm telling you. God help me if I'm teaching you error. And God help her because she did teach you error. She needs to repent. The whole thing was a lie. She may have believed the lie herself in her own ignorance. She may have been reacting to the hurt of her own background where women were suppressed, where wrong interpretations of what it meant for women to be silenced were imposed on the church. But no, women cannot teach doctrine to mixed congregations. These people like Joyce Meyer, these people like Beth Moore, these people like Heidi Baker, these people like Paula White are fundamentally out of God's order. They are controlled not by the Holy Spirit, but by a Jezebel spirit, and the men who go along with it are their Ahabs. It is wrong. So again, a praying woman, a sensitive woman, it's a very foolish husband, as I've said many times, a very foolish Christian husband who does not give careful weight to the counsel of a praying wife. Wife is a helpmeet to her husband, and a pastor needs a good helpmeet. Women exercise spiritual authority over other women and through their husbands, but always under the covering of their husband, their father, the male leadership of the church, as the church is under the covering of Christ. Does that mean women are inferior to men? No. The fact that a male could not anatomically sustain childbirth and a woman is stronger than a male in the pelvic area does not mean men are inferior to women. They're not at all. This means they're different. It means women have strengths that men don't anatomically and physiologically. The same is true psychologically and emotionally, and the same is true spiritually. Equal, but different. Let's go further. It was most unfortunate what she did. She took one passage out of another, out of context. Remember, a passage out of context 
a text out of context, an isolation from the co-text is always a pretext. And so it was with her. She took a passage that talked about, the Lord said, I will dwell in your midst. The Lord's dwelling in the church. He dwells among us. Does that only mean men? I'm not trying to be crude or offensive, but what? What? A pathetically foolish remark. It was talking about the church corporately, not individually. It was not talking about men and women as individual members of the church. It was talking about the church, and it is talking about the church, as a single corporate entity. The Lord dwells in its midst. It was not talking about the personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in context. But she takes the text out of context, an isolation from co-text, and makes it a pretext. Arriving at this not only hideous, but demonic conclusion that the word of God does not mean what it says, that women can be preachers. I know my daddy told me so. She calls God her daddy. Well, the Hebrew term is father, pater in Greek. Uh, daddy, that kind of familiarity with the Almighty. That's problematic in itself. No, her father did not show her that. If God is her father, he did not show her something that contradicts his word. This woman is a deceiver. She may be deceived herself. She may actually believe these lies of the devil, but they are lies of the devil. Taking text out of context, packaging it with, per, with manipulative, persuasive speech, pretending that that's the anointing of the Spirit. It was not the anointing of the Spirit. It was another spirit. What it was is emotionally charged religiosity that preys on women. Vulnerable women who Paul warned must be protected. They are weaker in this area. They prey on women. Now, there's men who prey on women. But in today's world, we have women who prey on women. We've always had that with Queen Athlea and things like this in the scripture. But there's no shortage of it today. No, this woman, Dana Cosby, is a false teacher. She's deceived, and she deceives others, and she will be held accountable unless she repents. It's completely wrong. But she is only one example of this currently in vogue trend, complementarianism. It is actually being taught in seminaries by supposedly learned theological professors. Oh, I don't want to know what women can't do. I want to know what they can do. Fair enough, but that does not negate what the scripture says about what they can't do. Men can't have babies. Doesn't work. Never will. Homosexual men want babies, so they want the right to adopt other people's because they can't have their own. It works. This is the world. This is the enemy. And it's gotten into the church. Complementarianism. No. It's simply spiritual seduction. Manipulation. Because she's a false teacher who's being used by Satan to mislead the body of Christ and to deceive other women. To equate prophecy? With the teaching? No, 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 no. Amelia is not the Daskin. To say because women preach the gospel, women can teach. No, 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 no. Kerygma is not the Daskin. 
To say that education can change the nature of fallen man? No, it cannot. It can do other things, but it's not going to change the nature of man. And it's not going to change the nature of woman. take things that apply to the church corporately and to try to sexualize it and sexualize it so let's say genderize it what this woman does is pathetic and she's so smiley and nice and the girl next door and you know and she seems like a nice Christian lady Satan always comes as an angel of light she's teaching error now if this woman is a Christian if she is saved, she needs to go to the Lord and ask the Lord if what I've said is the truth. I bear her no hostility. I don't hate her. I don't despise her. But I despise everything she taught because it is a lie of the devil. This present trend of complementarianism, although it's in vogue, although it's a current trend, it's nothing but an old lie of Satan. That's what it is. And that's all it is. I love women. I thank God for women. Women are as smart as men. Women have physical abilities in certain areas, reproductively certainly greater than men. Women have psychological superiority to men in the area of sensitivity, even though it's also a vulnerability. I don't look down on women. I'm not a cessationist. I don't believe these charismatic gifts ended with the apostles. That's a doctrinal error. I don't believe it's wrong for women to teach other women. I don't believe it's wrong for women to be deaconesses. I don't believe it is wrong for women to practice charismatic gifts in God's order. But it is wrong for women to teach doctrine to mixed congregations. It is wrong for women to be pastors. Leadership is male. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you so much. For